let me give you an example of these five right questions in action. Because when we just talk about the questions themselves, it gets to be kind of an intellectual thing, a knowledge thing. And you've probably heard me say before, knowledge really isn't power. Uh, understanding and wisdom, that's where the power really starts to kick in. So let's move this out of some artificial conversation into a real example. Now, there was a guy at the TGN weekend, and I'll call him Peter because that was his name. And Peter is in a real rock and roll company, and they're doing just a tremendous growth business right now all around the world. And his ultimate upline has a system, a strategy for um, growing the business and bringing people in. It's based on bringing people into the business and having them commit to sending out X amount, giving away X amount of samples of the product. Now, in marketing, uh, there are three chores for every marketer. One, to create the initial trial. Get people to try your product. That's got to be done first. Number two is then to create an, a franchise out of those people who try your product. They like your product. They continue to buy your brand. That's a franchise. And the third level is what's known as a consumer advocacy. And that, that's a group of people who, you, who tried your product, really like your product, and they go out and they tell people about your product. That's the advocacy part. Now, what's uh, and, and just a, a bit of a sidebar, uh, that's part of the brilliance of network marketing is we reward people for that consumer advocacy. Now, that's a natural occurrence. People who try things and like things, they say good things about them to their family, their friends, their associates, people they run into. They're just recommending and recommending and recommending kind of out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, truth of the matter is it's just a natural thing that people do and network marketing multi-level marketing has harnessed that with a reward structure a commission structure that pays you for doing that kind of thing so anyway back to the point creating trial is a powerful thing to do problem for Peter was that this looked an awful lot like front-loading to him and he was just on rails about that. And what I mean by that is he was completely consumed. He could do nothing but see what was wrong, what was wrong, what was wrong. For him, what was wrong was um, what if the people didn't uh, stay with the business? They would have a closet full, a garage full, a warehouse full of, of these bottles of product. And that was not a good thing. He didn't want to be responsible for that. He didn't want people... Uh, being able to come back and point their finger at him and say, you told me to do this and now I'm out, you know, $1,000, $2,000, $5,000, whatever it was. And he was all caught up in what was wrong, what was wrong, what was wrong, what was wrong, what was wrong. And he was nowhere near any solution for himself, for a, a strategy that he could use to build his business, for his own peace of mind. He was all caught up in what was wrong. And the only positive energy around w was his anger about it. And that's not a very positive, productive, creative energy. So finally, um, after eroding him down, down, down a little bit, a lot, uh, I got him to use the five right questions. So what's right about this sampling program where people come into the business for a thousand two thousand dollars and more so he took a look at that and he came up with some things immediately that were right about it one was the commitment level of those people how it identified real business builders people whose intention was to build a business these were people who put their money where their mouth is um, in addition there was the commissions to the enrolling distributor uh, boy, that made it real attractive to go out and get people and, and get that level of commitment and get that going. So those were some things that were right that Peter found when he began to look at it. Then the second question, what makes them right? And as he began to look at each one of those things, he developed a deeper understanding because that second question 
moves you into looking for people's values. What are, what are the values here? What's really important here? And that's an energy building question. Then after answering those, again, energy building up, he gets to go to that third question, which is, Peter, what would be ideal? And what he began to discover as he described the dream, the vision, what would be ideal, was how people could come in for 20, 50, 100, 200, uh, or more bottles of product. And they, he would create, he, the sponsor, would create with them a strategic plan on how they were going to send those out to people, what, in what fashion were they going to alert people, how they were going to follow up, how he was going to teach them what to do and what to say. A real partnership was part of his ideal. And then the fourth question. So what's missing? What's missing, which if it was in place, would bring about this ideal? And that's that's what's, that question is actually what's wrong. But because it comes in the progression of identifying what's right and building energy, finding out what makes it right, building even more energy, entertaining the vision, the visionary question, looking at the ideal, that question of what's missing, which if it was in place would bring about the ideal, uh, gets dealt with in a whole different matter manner. It's, it's positive, it's um, affirming, it's, uh, it's curious and not critical, and it's really creative. You're looking for, gosh, what, all right, now, what can we do here to make this ideal? Uh, it's a whole different ballgame than a focus on the problem, a focus on what's wrong. You're literally looking for the holes in the vision the things that need to be filled in, where you can focus your creative efforts, and in truth, the universe's creative efforts as well. Last question is the question, I say the question that leads you. When Kurt Wright first explained these to me, he called it the question that drives you, and I don't really like that push, push, push of drive. This question really leads you, and it leads you because it leads to inspired action. And the question is, what will it take to put in place what's missing to bring about that ideal? And it truly, it always, your answers to that always lead to inspired action. What will it take? It will take developing uh, a system. It will take uh, learning how to teach people what to do and what to say to make sure that this sampling program works for them, that, it, that their investment yields some real activity, that it attracts business builders, it attracts customers, and what to do and what to say to have that happen. So that's an example of using the five right questions to turn around a, a, a really negative, non-productive, energy-draining, bad-feeling focus on what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, by looking at what's right about this thing. And you can use that in any and every circumstance you encounter. Uh, even the most difficult, upsetting, challenging problem or thing not going the way you want it to be. Apply the five right questions. Look for what's right. Focus on that. And, and don't think you're avoiding what's wrong. It will come up. But, but first, you find out what's right, what makes it right, and you look at the ideal. And from that point of view, from getting to that place, when you then look at what's missing, what's wrong becomes a productive component and not something that, that drains your energy and keeps your wheels spinning.